say is with a very, very high standard of questions, and we've got our brains working already trying to answer these. And if some questions will be no, that we cannot give a definite answer because there may not be a definite answer known. But we just take alternate ones. Um, so the first question here I have is how common is avascular necrosis in lupus patients? And if one joint is affected, how likely is it that multiple joints will be affected? Avascular necrosis is luckily a rare problem that um, the blood supply to the hip or, or other joints and becomes affected and it can cause quite a lot of pain and damage and often the person affected will need to have a joint replacement. It um, can be associated with patients with lupus and particularly in people who have long term steroid therapy but also people with other chronic conditions. Um, there isn't a definite answer to if you have it in one joint, will multiple joints be affected because it kind of depends on the risk factors for why it happened in the first place and whether those risk factors are ongoing. Most patients in my experience will only have avascular necrosis in one joint, but I have seen patients with it in other joints. Um, so you really have to look at the risk factors for why it happened and try and prevent those risk factors if possible. Sometimes it's not possible. Um, luckily it's relatively rare but can be very serious. Um, so possibly, but hopefully not affect other joints. And whoever asked that question, if anything else they want to ask? The name's not on it. Um, I've got here, what's the incidence of osteoporosis or thin bones in lupus, non-steroidal treated or otherwise? Um, Non-steroidals are not usually associated with thin bones, but steroids certainly are. This is quite a difficult one actually because it depends on a few things. Uh, for women, it will depend on whether or not uh, the before or after the menopause, because the biggest cause of osteoporosis in women is the sharp drop in bone loss that occurs around the menopause. But clearly, um, we're always um, vigilant if we're about to have to give someone steroids at that particular juncture um, and you'll probably find that you will get sent for a DEXA scan or a bone density scan to see exactly where you are on the scale of things. There are algorithms or schedules for treatment of um, thin bones when people are on steroids and also prevention of thin bones if you go on to steroids but that tends to be age determined as well. I think this comes back to um, the business of trying to keep the dose of steroids if we have to use them as low as possible. Um, lupus itself causing osteoporosis, that's a really difficult one because inactivity um, can be associated with osteoporosis, inflammation of the joints can. Um, so keeping active uh, and that type of thing, uh, having a healthy diet, all of that can be really important to offset that aspect of things uh, as it's important from a medical point of view that we try and offset the steroids and if necessary offer new treatment for osteoporosis if, if you need it. Yeah, I've got a question here, um, it's from Karine Gordon, if the person's happy to have their name mentioned. Can lupus be connected? <laughs> <laughs> So lupus can certainly be connected to other autoimmune conditions, um, particularly thyroid disease is a very common association with, with patients with lupus. Um, it can also be associated with, with type 1 diabetes, um, conditions such as primary villous cirrhosis and a number of other autoimmune conditions. So yes, patients with one autoimmune condition may be at a slightly higher risk of other autoimmune conditions or have other autoimmune conditions scattered throughout their family. So chronic fatigue syndrome is, is a very poorly understood condition. Um, fatigue is obviously a massive part of, of lupus um, and it sometimes can be difficult to diagnose that separately from lupus itself because of the fatigue. Um, we don't think it's an autoimmune condition but it's poorly understood but chronic fatigue and chronic pain can go along with patients with other chronic health problems because of the, the effects of that. Um, so, so yes, there are an association with other autoimmune diseases and that can be different with, with different families and different groups. But thyroid disease um, and, and some autoimmune liver problems are relatively common. Did that answer your question or was there anything? I'm, not sure. I'm going to do two together. And 
Um, one is what is known about lupus and the brain, and how does lupus affect memory loss? And in many ways, central nervous system lupus is the kind of final frontier of lupus, if you like, and it's probably the least well uh, understood of all the systems involved. And I think it's probably the area um, which we'll see most developments, particularly as imaging of the types of MRI scanners and so on that we have evolve. And there are beginning to become MRI scanners that don't just look at abnormalities of the structure, but can also look at the function. There are a very small number of people who, if we do an MRI scan, the MRI will be abnormal. And it's very difficult to tell if there's inflammation in these blood vessels or there's something else with them. We know that if you have anti-phospholipid antibodies, these are the antibodies that make the blood a bit more sticky, uh, that can sometimes be a problem, so we always look out for them. Um, things like mood disturbance and so on, I think is actually really quite difficult uh, to know whether that's related to abnormalities of the brain or the understandable effects of the, the kind of overwhelming aspect of the, the having the disease itself. Um, so I think these are really, really difficult to tease out. Thankfully, it is actually quite rare. Um, that's probably about as, as, as much as we can say about the brain. So you've got a question here. Neonatal lupus is temporary, but what is the chance of children inheriting lupus itself? And I think that's always a concern for people when they have a chronic condition, is what is my chance of passing this on to my children and grandchildren? It's something that worries, worries people a lot. We don't fully understand why, why people get lupus. We think there's a combination of genetic and environmental factors. We're starting to get here slowly with genetics and very, very slowly with environmental factors, but we can't give any individual person a definite answer to why they have lupus as opposed to somebody else. We know there probably is a high, or there definitely is a very slightly increased risk in, in offspring. I couldn't give you a figure to that, and it probably varies very much from family to family in each particular genetic predisposition to that and we're not really fully there, um, there will be, well, uh, be a figure, but it's a relatively low figure and I try and, uh, and say to people that yes, there is a chance, but the chance is relatively small, but you know, we just need to keep in mind if anyone develops symptoms, um, so by no means certain that any children will develop it. I've got another one here, do most women feel a lessening of symptoms after the menopause? Um, there's always been a uh, question mark over uh, whether hormones affect uh, rheumatic conditions, and that's often asked uh, of us about rheumatoid arthritis as well. Um, I don't feel there, there probably is a lessening of symptoms after the menopause. Um, I, think, uh, I think people sometimes feel less well, but they have menopausal symptoms, maybe on top of their lupus symptoms, but there isn't really anything that says um, that lupus will get better uh, after the menopause, I know. And another one, this is the $64,000 question, I think, what are the medicines <coughs> actually doing? <laughs> <laughs> I think we ask ourselves that quite a lot. And I'm taking it from this, um, the person who's asking is wondering about immunosuppressant medicines, is that right? As opposed to all the other uh, medicines. If we think of um, lupus as a, a complicated disorder of multiple aspects of the immune system overreacting, really what we're trying to do is dampen down these various, uh, these various aspects of it. And there's two aspects to this. There's dampening down the effects of the disease, and steroids are quite good at that. Um, you can imagine if you've got uh, a swollen knee, for instance, through inflammation, if we give you steroids, it will dampen that down, symptoms will recede, and you'll probably be to walk. But we probably haven't treated the underlying reason why the knee became swollen in the first instance. And that's where a drug like hydroxychloroquine or methotrexate or something like that would come into play. These drugs have a deeper effect on the immune system, so they dampen it down and through time reduce this tendency to inflammation um, and hopefully keep disease more stable. So that's why we call them disease modifying, because they actually treat the disease. Whereas drugs like anti-inflammatory drugs like Brufin, Naproxen, that type of thing, will tend to treat symptoms of pain and can be very helpful in 
so steroids, they just don't tend to treat the disease itself. So most people find themselves on a combination of medicines to treat the disease, maybe hydroxychloroquine, methotrexate, azathioprine, something like that, um, to treat the effects of inflammation. Uh, they might need to take anti-inflammatories from time to time. We might offer the odd steroid injection um, if the disease is in a flare to get it settled quickly. And day to day you might take um, some painkillers. So hopefully that uh, explains um, that sort of too late. So again, these are some, some, some very difficult questions for us about complementary therapy because again, I don't really think there are unfortunately very clear answers. Do I need to take coenzyme Q10 when I take statins and is glucosamine beneficial when no joint problems? So coenzyme Q10, um, we are not, I think it's a B vitamin complex, if anybody can inform me on that. Um, it's certainly not essential to take along with statin. I'm presuming the question is about the antioxidants and the anti-inflammatory effects of, 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 of coenzyme Q10. Um, I really don't think there is a clear answer to that. It's certainly, not it's certainly not something that would be essential. Whether it has an additional beneficial effect is uncertain. Um, it's something that certainly some people do find benefit from. It's unlikely to cause any additional problems or interact with other medications. So it could be taken along with that, but we wouldn't say it was an essential medication to be taken. Glucosamine is, is a medication that has been looked at extensively in patients with osteoarthritis um, or degeneration of joints. Um, there have been lots of clinical studies looking at that. And, and some of those studies have shown beneficial effects and like taking glucosamine might be as effective as taking anti-inflammatories for, for pain relief. Um, it's certainly not been looked at in other causes of arthritis or joint pain. We get asked quite often when people have rheumatoid arthritis, for example, but it's not been studied in that. Um, so if somebody has osteoarthritis or degenerative problems in your joints, there might be some benefit. But again, the clinical trials have not been so definite that we can recommend it as a prescribed medication. Some GPs do. Um, but certainly as lupus of an illness and the joint pains related to lupus, there would be no indication to take that only if there was osteoarthritis and then only, again, it's not 100% certain. But it's a safe medication and some patients with osteoarthritis do like to supplement that, but not for lupus-related arthritis in itself, no. I've got the last one here, it's a, another difficult one. Won't prolonged medication trigger lupus? Uh, I mean, one of the things we don't really know is what does trigger lupus. Um, there are some medications where there's a question mark over them and they tend to be more old fashioned drugs, um, some blood pressure type drugs and so on that we don't really use very much now. And I'm thinking to you know, my own clinic, when people come with have they got lupus, we always have a look at the medications and we never really find any of these. So I think it's actually quite uncommon. And it's always quite difficult to attach um, <coughs> cause and effect. And we find this not only um, in patients who have lupus, we find it actually in patients with rheumatoid arthritis and other uh, autoimmune problems, uh, teasing this out. But I think, uh, I think it's probably not a common cause, and I think uh, the drugs that usually pop up in the main lists tend not to be very commonly used drugs. Do you feel differently about that, mm -hmm. um, just, just to add, actually, at the end, just to say that, um, firstly, I'm very pleased to see so many specific medical questions, because firstly, it gets me off the hook <laughs> in the question and answer session. Um, but also, also this fact that when you have any long-term condition, uh, that information is power, and to get that kind of sense of empowerment back in your life, you know, having these questions answered is incredibly important for for everyone's self-management. And I can imagine, even with the questions that have been asked, I can imagine everyone has a few questions about about their condition somewhere. You might not be able to think of them today, uh, but you'll you'll be thinking of them constantly. Um, what, I, what I would advise is, is something that I do personally is when I have these questions I write them down. I have a, one place that I write these specific medical questions down and then when I go to see my consultant or specialist nurse then I bombard them with about 20 odd questions uh, that I have specific to the condition. And it's finding out these things about your condition, specific uh, medical information 
uh, that is absolutely key to your self-management and key to being able to pull some of that uh, power back that a long-term condition can quite often take away from you. Is Lucas on the increase? <laughs> I think the answer to that is probably no, because I think we still get back the, the kind of same prevalence and incidence as we did a few years ago. So I think I think it's not on the increase actually, but I think is the detection of it on the increase. Um, I think it, it may well be because I. You know, we're talking about, I think Gavin was mentioning, awareness amongst general practitioners, for instance. Uh, I get the impression that's definitely higher. And people will certainly think about it. And you'll certainly get uh, people referred in, do we think they might have it? Um, not at a late stage, but at an early stage. And obviously we're happy to see people and either reassure them or alternatively make an early diagnosis. One of the difficulties is that in years gone past we had less in the cupboard to use. So patients often did find themselves on steroids for more prolonged periods. The, the kind of tendency now is we tend to use um, steroids in short bursts and then try and wean them down and treat with background therapy. In terms of um, low dose, I think low dose we think is probably about 5 milligrams a day. That's felt to be about what the body would normally produce. It can be very difficult to get back to that amount, um, but I think that's what we would think was, was lowish dose. And we accept that um, there are many patients who would, would not be able to get off their steroids, so we wouldn't want them to go away um, all worried about it. Um, we tend to and wean back as far as we can, and then closely monitor for all of the other things. And, you know, things like osteoporosis and, and weight gain and all of that, I think once you're, you're attuned to it and you have knowledge about it and some information, um, from a medical point of view, we can be doing bone density scans and advising about treatments and so on. People can be exercising, strengthening their bones, making sure the calcium intake is okay and that type of thing. I think our aim is always to use the lowest dose that we possibly can. Mm -hmm. Is there any limit between the endometriosis? The heart rate is something that endometriosis is considered as possibly a condition? I think, I think the jury would still be out on that. I don't think there's enough to actually link them as part of profile if you like. Uh, I mean I think there are gynecological things that are emerging as autoimmune but sometimes it's quite important we don't put them all together if you like uh, and I think that one will be a more watch this space. identify the early steps where the immune system goes wrong. You know, once we're treating the disease where the immune system has gone wrong, and it's gone wrong in many places of the immune system as it's kind of gained momentum, you can imagine it becomes more and more difficult to treat. And the, the thrust of managing really all of the autoimmune diseases that we see in rheumatic practice is early, and the thrust of all the research is trying to pick up the early um, the early parts of the early folds, that's right. And some of that is back at gene level, but I think that's still some way off as yet. At the other end, um, there have been stem cell therapies. We have never had anybody who's had to have that, and I think that's incredibly rare indeed. And it's certainly not rooted as a, as a standard therapy or anything like that. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, 
David Hopkins, would you agree that uh, we do, that clinicians and generally we need to take far more uh, interest in environmental issues? And I base this upon a study that was done by our, one of our patrons of our uh, group in, in uh, Devon, Cornwall, who's looked at environmental issues, for example, the use of lipstick, which he's found uh, to be extremely toxic. Um, and one other comment, if the person who asked the question about uh, coenzyme Q10 Q would like to have a word with me after, I'd be happy to chat to you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 